language is C I I L. On the behalf of Central Institute of Indian Languages, Mysore, and Linguistic Society of India, I welcome all the dignitaries, the guests, the delegates, and all the scholars across India and all other parts of the globe who have joined us live for the 43rd International Conference of Linguistic Society of India, popularly known as ICOC 43. So, without further delay, I request you to allow me to begin with the session. India has a tradition of invocation that aims to inspire the audience member so as to give them the motivation to move forward with the specified task and ask for cooperation. So, I would like to request Sri Anustu Bhattacharya to begin with the invocation on his sitar. And the song that he's gonna play is Saraswati Vandana in Raga Beloved. So may I request Sri Anustu to continue.
Thank you, Anustu, for your enlightening performance. Let unity and integrity stream forth in the mind of every person. Now, let me invite Dr. Khan to formally welcome the guests and virtual attendees. Dr. Khan is a lecturer come junior research officer at CIIL and the officer in charge of National Transmission Mission. August gathering, Namaskar, and welcome to the 43rd International Conference of the Linguistic Society of India. I consider it my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural session and to this conference on behalf of the Central Institute of Indian Languages, on behalf of the Linguistic Society of India, and on my personal behalf. At first, I consider it my privilege to welcome our highly inspiring and accomplished linguist, Professor G. Uma Maheshwar Garu, who is also the president of the Linguistic Society of India. Welcome, sir. It's my delight to welcome Professor Shalendra Mohan, Director, Central Institute of, of Indian Languages, in the same breath. Welcome to you, sir, as well. I am also happy to welcome Professor Martin Haspelmuth, the keynote speaker and the guest of the day whose academic works have inspired one and all. Welcome to you, sir. I'm indeed very happy to welcome the life members and office bearers of the Linguistic Society of India. And it is a matter of joy to welcome the senior members of the Central Institute of Indian Languages, academic fraternity, and esteemed colleagues from CIL and other academic institutions. Most importantly, I would like to welcome the participants, the paper presenters, the chairpersons for various uh, parallel and thematic sessions. And I'm very pleased to yeah, welcome so the very young uh, friends. Actually giving a kind of introduction to Hespel Math, right? Yes, sir, yeah. it will follow. Okay. It will follow. Okay. And I also yes. find it a uh, sure. moment of happiness right. to welcome the volunteers to this wonderful morning and to this inaugural session. Welcome one and all. I consider this an opportune moment to have a look at the run up to this occasion and know what this, what this, this three day event has for us. As you might remember, the conference was announced on 1st September, 2021 with the submission deadline of 31st October, extended to 15th November, 2021. The conference announcement returned with uh, somewhere around 230 abstracts, which were reviewed by somewhere around 45 reviewers who recommended about 176 abstracts for presentation at this conference. And the registration link was sent this was returned by, by 205 authors and we notice a ratio of 93 is to 83 uh, authors. We have six expert talks and eight parallel sessions, which makes around 32 thematically organized sessions. We have around 40 experts chairing these sessions and proceedings. Around 154 presentations to take place in these three days. There are about uh, eight countries participating and several languages and language families being represented. I'm very happy to also inform you that all areas of theoretical linguistics, applied linguistics, and interdisciplinary linguistics are represented through various papers that are to be presented. Once again, a very warm welcome to one and all. And look, we look forward to very invigorating and informative interaction in the sessions to follow. Thank you. Thank you so much, 
sir for your welcome speech moving ahead i take great honor to invite professor g uma maheshwara rao the president of linguistic society of india lsi for the inaugural address dr rao has worked as a director of center for applied linguistic and translation studies at the university of hyderabad dr rao has also served as a former president at dravidian linguistic association and as a member of general council kendriya sahitya academy professor rao has actively contributed to the field of computational linguistic and is among the very few linguists trained in historical linguistic dr rao has been an inspiration for several generation of linguistic in this country Should I start? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you that. Thank you for that introduction about me. Uh, namaskar to everybody. And uh, let me just uh, expose my presentation to you all. Can you see it? Yeah, oh, I think right. <laughs> Can't see the to avoid infinity measure. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Okay. I thank you all. <clears throat> A very good morning to you all, and welcome to the forty-third International Conference of the Linguistic Society of India, as we call it as ECOL Sci forty-three. Uh, that's held between 21 today and uh, till 23rd of the December 2021 at the Central Institute of Indian Language, Mysore. This is collaborated with the Linguistic Society of India. The Linguistic Society of India was registered under the Act of 21 of 1860, extended by beyond by Bombay Public Trust in 1950. Uh, so, so it is a, a very 
old uh, society about the linguistics in India. And uh, I have something actually to declare to you all today. As you are all aware, we are deeply engrossed in documenting and studying to preserve many and endangered language across the corners of India. We can even feel the scope of endangered languages extended to include the constitutionally recognized major languages showing the dangerous, dangerous trends of recession before English. Indian languages are fast becoming the languages of casual, casual study and not as the important languages in the medium of instruction in the educational sector. As you can see from a survey that is taken for the last uh, uh, three years during uh, 1997 and 2002 and 2009, I have here figures where you can see how English medium is taking over even the primary, upper primary and middle school and high school education in India. It has already taken more than 33%, okay, as it stands on today in high school education. So this is the trend that we are facing today. And the current state of affairs have set in a situation which is recognizably a linguistic feudalism. There is a hierarchy of languages or the national and the local and regional languages, national languages and uh, different languages from the globe, etc. So all these languages are still presenting something like a, a, in a, a, a hierarchy of linguistic feudalism. The phrase linguistic feudalism denotes the essential characteristics of the early Middle Ages that has invested the exaggerated prominence and place undue emphasis on the importance to one with a special mode of economy that is detriment of the others, especially of social, economic, and political life. Exactly this is reflected in our languages today. English language market, as we grasp some of the existing English language learning market published by the meticulous research, the English language learning market is expected to grow at a rate of 6.2% to reach, that is about 4 lakh, 400,000, okay, or about 1,400, 6,000 crores, that is about $55 billion, 55 billion US dollars by 2027. The share of ALLM by various countries is like this. The Asia Pacific regions remains the major contributor to the global English language learning market as the largest game provider. So Asia Pacific includes major um, populations from China and India, and of course, and other countries like Japan, Indonesia, and other countries. And uh, the factors driving the growth of the Asia Pacific English language learning market are growing government focus towards the educational sector. So the governments are actually taking this particular aspect of English market or the marketing English into these countries. The key, the key players among the top dozen key players include and who are operating in the global English language learning market 10 of them are from US and UK. So who are the beneficiaries? These are US and UK, not these, uh, and not the, the one that we have seen as the, ma the major region which is contributed to the English market. So Asia Pacific region functions as the English market, whereas the key role is played by the top dozen uh, <clears throat> marketeers, which include 10 of them are from US and UK. The key end users, and who are these guys? The individual learners segment is projected to register the fastest CAGR, the compounded average growth rate driven by the growing use of internet and the rising number of mobile users and mobile apps. 
India has the second largest number of internet users next to China, right? It is almost uh, twice the size of the United States. And Indian language use on the internet is growing. And if this kind of trend continues, so the medium of instruction in India undergoes this shift in the change, then what would happen at home? So the most of the uh, direct targets include printing and publications industry, advertising industry, news and print media industry, the film industry, the TV and the electronic media, the internet and the social media at home, and next to all the people like poets, authors, lyricists, and other writers, artists, actors, narrators, anchors, technicians, musicians, singers, composers, performing artists, artists, and educators, teachers, and trainers. So all of the members of the society who use language in, in their industry would suffer from this. Languages are the landmarks of human heritage that you are aware of it. Languages reflect our way of life and our thought. Languages preserve the diversity of human civilization as the biological diversity is the key for the survival of life forms. Language diversity is vital for the survival of human civilizations. And linguistic diversity increases employment opportunities. Mother tongue is the key to end the global hunger. However, the English, the growing English market does not suggest these things. A language's viability is directly proportional to the extent of the economic security that it provides to its speakers. The economic security from a language can effectively resist the language shift. Languages of a community become vulnerable because we are slapped with the misjudged and misplaced language policies. The economic contributions of Indian languages to the Indian economy is often ignored in policy making. We need to investigate the contributions of language in terms of the economic realizations of it by its users in the day-to-day -day transactions of their actions so that these investigations, the reports of these investigations will be seriously considered by the governments. Okay, I'll shift this one. This is actually how the literacy GDP in India and the state, various Indian states and the Indian territories. Okay, however, I'll not go into details of this, but I'll move into uh, other, some other important slides. Language affects the financial status of the society. In turn, the society can also influence the social status of the language. The economy of a society is largely linked to the language. To understand the dynamics of the economy of a society, we need to compute the economic value of the languages. Language economically empowers the individual Consequently, his social status. This is what exactly we have to emphasize and proof to the Indian languages as means of economic activity is here. This is about a summary of the statistics that demonstrate the economic activity in Indian languages and English in India. So we have of course about the, the 10 standard economic sectors, the economic activity performed by each individual in the country across the states of India and the union territories. And these economic activities are include agriculture, fisheries, forestry, hunting, and manufacturing and repair, construction and other kind of functions, mining and quarrying, hotels and restaurants, and transportation, storage, and communications, wholesale and retail trade, and electricity, gas, and the water supply, and public administration and defense. And finally, the financial and business activities. These 10 economic sectors are the major contributors 
to the Indian GDP, the gross domestic product. And this gross domestic, gross domestic product is produced, is produced. This is finally after the computation. The, see the second column. The second column is actually how the GDP sector wise is contributed and to the total and percentage of the GDP sector wise to the total 100% of the GDP and percentage of the GDP by the graduate workforce. That means the, the whoever are involved in the creation of wealth working in each of these economic sectors and their contribution to the group contribution is provided here in the fourth uh, okay that this is seven, and it is 4.63 in the first economic sector that is agriculture fisheries forestry and hunting the second one 5.37 percent in the manufacturing repair and 5.45 percent in the construction activity and 7.61 percent by mining and quarrying and 8.49% in the hotels and restaurant and other kind of similar industry, and 10% in the transportation, storage, and the other communication sectors, and 12.53% in the wholesale and retail trade, and 18% in the electricity, electricity, gas, and water supply, and 29%, that is the major okay, group of uh, graduates work in this particular sector that is public administration and defense sector and uh, finally it is the 46 percent of the graduate workforce in india work in the financial and business activity and creating wealth to that extent and of course the fifth column provides actually uh, non-graduate workforce uh, the sorry, sixth column gives you percentages by non-graduate workforce. So a major percentage is actually in the agriculture, fisheries, and forestry and hunting. And of course, uh, 51 percent, point five four percent in the manufacturing repair, and of course, much lesser in the other industries. And percentage of total literates who are contributing for the the uh, realization of wealth through agriculture fisheries and forestry and hunting involve about 52 percent and in manufacturing repair total literates in, involved are 56 percent and whereas in the construction activity the total literates involved are about 63 percent and so on and so forth okay so the illiterates, whoever are there in who are working in each of these, each of these economic activities, 47% of the illiterates work in the agriculture, fisheries, forestry, and hunting, and 43% in the manufacturing repair, and of course less and lesser as you go down in the financial and business activities, uh, very much less. It's about the five five percent of them. Okay, now. I, I will actually list down here the percentage of GDP produced by these illiterates includes this, this uh, column 10th provides those things. And the total percentage of that includes, this is about uh, a total of 25% of the GDP is produced by the illiterates here. And percentage of GDP produced by other than the graduate workforce is about 82 percent and the total okay indian language means people who are working with using indian languages and producing the economic wealth annually working through the economic activity various sectors of the economic equity have produced in 2011 about roughly 84.52 percent of the gdp of india and people working through english have produced 15.48 percent of gdp of india and all these people both those 
um, mother tongue users of the mother tongue and users of the english both have been actually working to different sectors sector 1 to sector 10 through uh, this agriculture fisheries through financial and business activities and indian language workforce has produced about sorry this is 82.73 percent and english language workforce is actually has produced about 17.27 percent for this shows that a majority of the a greater majority of the workforce in india who produce <clears throat> maximum percentage of the gdp of india actually produce these through indian languages not through english in using english only 17.27 percentage of gdp of india is produced by english are produced through english this is actually the summary of the statistics demonstrating the economic activity in Indian languages and in English in India. This is the total India. Okay. If I go for the state wise, certain states, I can show how actually this is being done. Okay. Uh, this is about the summary of the statistics demonstrating the economic activity in the two Telugu states, that is Andhra Pradesh, the erstwhile Andhra Pradesh when it was not separated into Telangana and uh, current Andhra Pradesh, <coughs> where the total uh, GDP is produced through Indian languages is about 84.52% and through English is 15.48%. It's closely corroborating with the uh, the overall Indian picture. And the second one, <clears throat> and if I go for the figures showing you about the Kerala state GDP, the Kerala state is one of the uh, most advanced state in the literacy growth rate in India. And it has about 93% of the uh, citizens of the people of Kerala state are literates. And of course, uh, the Kerala state GDP and the languages involved, uh, that is particularly any languages of the English language, provide the statistics like this. About, this is actually what, 89% uh, of GDP of Kerala state is produced through the, through Indian languages. That is actually the, the major language is of course here it is Malayalam and of course certain other minor Indian languages. And in English, or the GDP that is produced in Kerala by using English language is about 10.991%. That is of course closely about 11% of the Indian GDP is produced using English in Kerala. And now if I go to other state, the economic contribution of the languages in the state of Karnataka, which is considered among the number one state in the, the computer uh, based industry. And in this case, even it is about Indian languages, using Indian languages, the GDP of uh, growth rate includes here about 82.73%. That is, 82% of our GDP in Karnataka is produced using Indian languages. That is the major language here is Kannada. And English actually fills the second as the 17%. That is 17% of the GDP produced by the Karnataka state is through use of English, right? And finally, Okay, another state I'll go to, okay, maybe. Oh yeah, this is the uh, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, and of course Kerala, these three states from the south, and of course the entire Indian picture, all of them show about more than 82% of the GDP of India is produced through the use of Indian languages. And only about 15%, percent or 15 to 17 percent of Indian GDP is actually contributed through the use of English. So showing these figures, we have something else to say. Okay, let us consider this and what the new educational policy has to say. 
New Education Policy 2020 promises wherever possible the medium of instruction until at least grade five, but preferably till grade A and beyond will be the home language and mother tongue and the local language or the regional language, right? Thereafter, the home language or the local language shall continue to be the to be taught as a language wherever possible. This will be followed by both the public and the private schools. So it is not actually exception to the corporate schools or the public or the private schools, but it is actually for all the schools. However, this is not act enacted as a, a policy. Both the developed and the developing countries continue to use mother tongue as medium of education. Mother tongue as the medium of education is in accordance with the principles of social and civic justice. Where there is no space for mother tongue instruction, the classroom becomes relevant to our students. The concept of teaching in the language of people is the source of strength of democracy. I'll skip some of these things and go to the other things. Okay, for example, compare, compare it to statistics of some South Asian countries with reference to their languages and the per capita income and the population, etc. Uh, top some, some of these countries, and you can compare with India. Uh, Taiwan, the per capita income that is provided here, and of course, these are in the rupees, and the literacy of the uh, the percentage most of these uh, literacy percentages are of course in the Indian language their respective languages and uh, area and the square kilometers of the countries and the populations in crores of these countries in, in comparison with the other countries so on the South Korea it is about a 97 percent uh, literacy rate and uh, it's a per capita income is of course here given here 24,000 24 lakhs 21,209 okay and China, Thailand it is 10 crores 83,443 and China it is of course less is a 9 crores 87,000 sorry it's 9 lakhs 87,922 and Mongolia is a much larger country but it's a smaller population however of course the literacy is in the mother tongue and it is uh, uh, 7 lakhs 87,502 and the literacy percentage is 48, 98 percent and India with 4 lakhs 24,449 per capita income with the percentage of literacy is in 74 percent and Andhra Pradesh compared with okay, Andhra Pradesh and of course here the Telangana state is a one lakh each roughly and percentage of literacy rates are about 67 and 64 percent so it shows that wherever the percentages and the literacy rates are low and of course correspondingly the per capita income is also low where the percentage of literacy rates are high and the per capita income is also high and usually it should be known that the literacy percentage of rates is actually taken from the respective uh, native languages so wherever the percentages of literacy rates are less that means the literacy in the uh, native percentages native language is much less naturally the percentage in the per capita income is also less so in order to increase our the per capita income it is necessary that citizens of these countries actually uh, to get educated and the literacy rate should go high go up to reach the higher percentages and of course wherever actually people encounter english medium it has been shown that one the percentage of the dropout rates also in, uh, increase so the introduction of english medium has actually shown the increase in the uh, dropout rates in both the andhra pradesh and in telangana here okay these are the percentages where the uh, dropout rates have increased by 21 percent 
whereas actually gain here, whatever it is increased, it is a gain in the Telugu medium, whereas it's increased in the English medium. And similarly, it is in the uh, Telangana state. So the dropout rates have in shown increase in the English medium, whereas actually down, down to the Telugu medium. So whoever have dropped out in the English medium have actually come to the Telugu medium as shown by these by the Telangana state. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank yes, you. sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Considering the shortage of time, for the time being, there is a slight arrangement in the program schedule. So, may I request <laughs> Professor Martin Haspelman? for the keynote on language description and language universal. Professor Martin Haspelman is a senior research scientist at the Department of Linguistics and Cultural Evolution at Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology since 2020 and present. From 2015 to 2020, he served as senior research scientist at Department of Linguistics and cultural evolution at the Max Planck Institute for Science of Human History in Jena. From 1998 to 2015, he served as a research sci scientist at the Department of Linguistics, Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, Leipzig. From 1994 to 1996, as an assistant professor, Freya Universität Berlin, from where he completed his PhD as well. He is a comparative linguist who studies the diversity of world's grammatical and lexical system and tries to understand what is universal about them. He is best known for co-editing the World Atlas of Language Structure 2015-2005-2013 and has worked as a co-founder of Language Science Press. He is also an honorary professor at Leipzig University. He is one of the founders of open access publisher Language Science Press and has worked on the standard average European Sprachbund. Besides typology, his research interests include syntactic and morphological theory, language change, and language context. Over to you, sir. Professor Martin. Thank you very much. Oh. Welcome, sir. Yeah. Um, hello, yeah, thank you very much for this introduction. I'm uh, not so familiar with this format, so how could I share my slides? Oh, okay. Tariq, yeah, uh, yeah. So Martin, can you hear me? You have, yes, uh, you have an upward looking arrow at the center bottom of your screen. Yes. You please click on that. Okay. Can you click on that? Yes, I. It will uh, ask you to uh, share the screen. You'll have to give permission to share the screen. Okay. Okay. Now I see it. You have a choice whether you share one single window or you share the entire screen. Okay. Um, yes. Now yes. we can see your slides. Can you see my slides now? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so I'm still trying to understand how exactly it works, how I can move the slides. Please um, use the uh, arrow, arrow buttons to move the slides on your keyboard. Please use the arrow buttons. It doesn't seem to work. For me, this is a kind of completely new system for me. So, um, okay, so now I ended the presentation, right? Yes. So I will try it again. Um, so, can you see the slides now? Not yet. Not yet. Yes. 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 <clears throat> okay. So, 
uh, I cannot. I can only see my slides now, but that's that's fine. That's the main thing. Okay, so the, so then I'll start uh, presenting. Please go ahead. Okay, so um, I want to talk about two ways of approaching the study of human language. What I call here for this talk the description comparison approach, where we describe many languages worldwide and compare them, uh, as in the World Atlas of Language Structures. And a second, what I call here the deep reality approach, where we look for some deep underlying structure that is not immediately apparent uh, using abstract trees as in generative syntax. The description comparison approach may look a bit boring, like collecting butterflies and displaying them in a museum. The deep reality approach may look more exciting, like chemistry or physics, where it's been shown that the stuff that surrounds us consists of elements of atoms. So you may say, oh, these walls maps, they're like butterfly connections, and these generative syntax trees, well, they're like chemical formulas. Well, I think it's not that simple, unfortunately. So <clears throat> for the study of human language, we need to study and describe particular languages. And I assume that we're interested in theoretic linguistics, not just applied linguistics. We're interested in human language with a capital H, not just particular languages or P languages. So in other words, we want to do general linguistics. Now, there's a paradox here, what I called the general linguistics paradox in a recent paper. We want to explore and understand the nature of human language, but what we can observe directly is particular languages. So the answer is we study universals. We look for things that are similar across the world's languages. And I have a recent uh, paper about general linguistics in the journal Theoretical Linguistics. And I also explain there how I think general linguistics is different from theoretical linguistics. I fully realize that uh, most linguists are perhaps not so much interested in general linguistics or even theoretical linguistics. They may be more interested in applied linguistics, like the talk about the use of Indian languages in India versus English that, that was just given by the president. So, but general linguistics is my interest. Now, when we observe a particular language, we can describe it, but it does not tell us anything about human language directly. So consider words such as house, tree, or red, or dom, djerevo, krasny, in Russian, put, also put the Bengali uh, words here, um, just to illustrate diversity. So, but this diversity is random or accidental. The differences do not tell us anything about the nature of human language. And it's actually basically the same with morphosyntax. Languages differ in seemingly random ways. So I have a red house, Umenya Krasny Dom, in Russian, Bengali again. English has a transitive verb here that shows agreement with the possessor. I have, she has, and so on. Russian has no verb and has a special spatial preposition, U Minya. Bengali has a genitive possessor and a copula, like of me as a red house. So particular languages are not an immediate window to human cognition. They differ across populations, and they're learned like other aspects of human culture. So we're confronted with the general linguistics paradox, as I already mentioned. We want to understand the nature of human language, but what we observe is particular languages. And it's very similar in other areas of culture studies. For example, religious studies, what we can observe directly is particular religions. How do we learn from them about human religion in general? So take the field of comparative religion. I took this from a random website about com comparative religious studies. And Friedrich Max Müller, of course, was a famous comparative religious uh, scholar in the 19th century, well known in India. It so happens that Max Müller grew up in Leipzig. And so here I have a picture of Müller's school in Leipzig. Uh, and he attended Leipzig University. And actually, I used to have my um, office uh, actually in the house behind Müller's school. So I was kind of constantly reminded of this uh, scholar. Also just nearby is Müller's church that he attended as a young boy, uh, just crossing uh, the square. <clears throat> but then later in life, 
he studied all kinds of other religions, especially uh, the religions of India, and is very well known for this. So he took this description comparison approach uh, to a human religion. So the solution in general for comparing cultures is, um, or for, for studying human culture in general, is to compare them. So comparative religious studies, comparative grammar studies. I think it's very similar to that. Now the deep reality approach is rather different from this. Some linguists seem to think that there's a shortcut that we can get deep insights into the human language faculty by just studying a few languages or perhaps just one. So we can make these very abstract trees uh, without broad comparison. So, you know, like in chemistry, we have these abstract formulas. So let's take a concrete example. Uh, Mark Baker is a researcher in the United States and he has a very interesting recent book about his theory of dependent case. So he observed that in quite a few languages there's differential object marking, for example, in the Turkic language Sakha. This is rather similar to what we find in Hindi Urdu and actually quite a few other languages of India and South Asia generally. So when the object is definite, it gets a special accusative marker. Masha ate the porridge, but Masha ate porridge. And it also correlates with the position of the adverb. So Masha ate the porridge quickly versus Masha quickly ate porridge. And so because of some of these word order differences, uh, he proposes uh, these abstract constituency trees and then has a very abstract uh, theory uh, of differential accusative marking uh, in Sacha. Or take uh, Bart's analysis of English sentences like John has to eat an apple. So the tree that I showed earlier was actually from Bart 1998. It would be fascinating if it could be shown that simple sentences like John has to eat an apple really have such a rich underlying structure that is made up of a small set of innate building blocks. So I find this kind of research really fascinating. Finding these innate building blocks would be like finding the elements of chemistry, and this would be a major success. Mark Baker has this nice book, The Atoms of Language, in 2001, where he actually compares uh, the mind's hidden rules of grammar with the hidden elements of all the stuff that surrounds us. So if our abstract syntactic trees were indeed comparable to chemical formulas. But we don't know what the innate building blocks of syntax are. So <clears throat> we are not advanced as chemistry yet. And what is more, we have no research program for finding out. And even quite a few linguists who work in the Chomsky tradition now think there is no rich universal grammar. Even Chomsky himself uh, has said that he now rejects universal grammar well in some sense. So, you know, I have a blog post about this that I published one or two years ago. You can look at that if you're <clears throat> interested. And a well-known generative linguist, Julianne Legger, who edits journal NLT, has recently said that I've now convinced myself of a framework where merge is innate, but any other language-specific innate properties are highly suspect, requires significant evidence. Case, uh, case morphology is not universal. It varies considerably across languages, so it must be learned. Okay, so leaving aside the generative approach for the moment, let's look at description again, and then later comparison. So for language description, fortunately, uh, we're not groping in the dark. We know how to do it. We know how to design orthographies. We know how to write dictionaries. We know how to describe syntactic description, descriptions and even write entire grammars. So in the introduction, language science press was mentioned, and there are uh, um, quite a few grammars that were published in language science press, uh, even two from the South Asian region, Palula and uh, Yaka. Um, and uh, we add more and more of these grammars from around the world, and of course hundreds of languages have described uh, with uh, excellent grammars. This is solid work that future generations will be able to use, even if it does not give us direct insight into human language. But um, 
we can use it. I will show this later. Okay, so one important insight of the early 20th century is that different languages that only have different labels, uh, like house in English and Dom in Russian and so on, also different categories, so different semantic categories, for example. Grandfather, grandmother, English only has two categories, Hindi, Urdu has four categories there, or different morphosyntactic categories. So English only has a basic form and a genitive form, whereas, of course, uh, many Indian languages have many more case forms. And Franz Boas famously said, each language has its own categories. We should describe each language in its own terms. Now, if, on the other hand, we assume that all languages make use of the same categories, then we're tempted to impose the categories of our languages and other languages. So there was a German grammarian around the same time as Boas, who was describing Kinyamwezi, a language of Africa, where he said the nominative and the accusative have the same form. They can be recognized from the position in the clause. So do we say that all languages have a nominative and accusative? Well, Franz Boas would say, no, each language has its own categories. And in Kinyamwezi, well, it's the position in the clause. That's the language-specific category. But nominative and accusative case, this is something that's marked um, on the noun. But in contrast to Boas, Chomsky has expressed very different views. So he has the uniformity principle from 2001, where he says that in the absence Compelling evidence to the contrary, assume languages to be uniform, with variety restricted to easily detectable properties of utterances. So, when you have such a principle, it's easy to justify nominative accusative for the Bantu language Kinyamwezi, because there is no compelling evidence that Kinyamwezi has no nominative and no accusative. It has no marking, but it could be zero, for example, right? So, you know, there's no limit to abstractness uh, with such a principle. We could also justify zero determiners for Chinese, right? We could say there's Chinese as a DP and there's always a zero article there. Or we could justify pro drop in Italian. You know, normally one would say, well, the subject is expressed by the affix canta, canta, no canto. So the verbal affixes are the subject expression. Uh, and then there's double subject expression when you say le ragazze cantano, the, the girls sing, so the subject is expressed twice. But from the perspective of English, one posits zero pronouns, and then have something like prodrome, uh, which is a kind of really weird way of looking at other languages. So we know how to describe languages, uh, but we don't know what the innate building blocks are, if there are any. If we want to avoid ethnocentrism uh, and do justice to each language, then we must create new categories for each language. And I have a recent paper about this, the structural uniqueness of languages in the journal Asian Languages and Linguistics. The paper is not specifically about Asian languages, but I thought uh, I was invited to contribute and I thought I might contribute a general methodological paper. Okay, so now we have the language particular descriptions, but we want to compare them in order to arrive at universals, so that we know about, learn about human language in general. And uh, we don't have the same building blocks in all languages, so we need something I call measurement uniformity. Here, so we take these grammars, descriptions of languages throughout the world, and we make comparisons. So, for comparisons, we need uniform yardsticks for comparison. For example, to test this Greenbergian claim here in one, if the abnormal possessor precedes the noun, the object tends to precede the verb. And if it follows the noun, the object tends to follow the verb. If we want to test this, we have to determine the order of the ad possessor and the noun, and the order of the object and verb in a set of the world's languages. So, how do we do this? How do we measure order? Well, according to Dreyer, the dominant order is the order in more than 67% of occurrences in text. How do we measure possessor, noun, object, and verb? Now, according to Greenberg, we do that semantically. So, comparison is not based on the rules of the languages, because the rules do not make reference to text frequencies and to semantic notions. It's actually similar in, in other comparative 
areas, compare economics, we measure economic indicators like inflation by uniform yardsticks, while ignoring culture-specific rules about money and buying, let alone mental representations of money. Right, so we take a measuring approach, and I would say that it's similar in linguistics also. How do we compare phonological systems? By means of phonetic properties, not phonological values. So in general, I think comparison requires comparative concepts and not descriptive categories that reflect the rules of the language. I have a paper about this in 2010. The comparative concepts of linguistics are like the units of measurement in other sciences. They're somewhat arbitrary, but are applied in the same way to all languages. And this measurement uniformity allows us large-scale quantitative testing of universals. I have a uh, sort of longer blog posts about this, two methods for comparative grammar, measurement uniformity, building block uniformity. On the other hand, if we opt for the building block uniformity approach, the Chomsky approach, this doesn't allow us large-scale quantitative testing. And the universal testing must proceed in a slow and very piecemeal fashion. I had an interesting discussion uh, with David Pesetsky about this. David Pesetsky is a famous syntactician at MIT, and he sometimes interacts with me on Facebook. So we don't often meet at conferences in the last two years. There haven't been such conferences. So um, I, I told him in a discussion about parasitic gaps. Oh, thanks for all these references. There's a huge generative literature, I know. But the problem is this generative literature doesn't make claims that are readily testable. You first need an in-depth analysis based on the right theory, which we don't have yet. And then David Pazeski said, you've hit the nail exactly right on the head. For some reason, you don't agree that it's a real nail and it needs to be hit on exactly that head. <laughs> yes, indeed, the claims are not readily testable. And yes, indeed, you first need an in-depth analysis. That's the whole point of our work, why what passes for typology often doesn't look like maximally useful research. So, so he thinks we need in-depth abstract analysis first. But this is a very slow uh, research program. It's a very slow process. It has not really led to lasting findings that we can build on. There are many ideas floating around, many papers and dissertations, but no theories that have been tested and found to be solid. So I think if one adopts a description comparison approach, there's a more solid uh, method. I, I don't want to downplay the generative method too much because it has led uh, to many lower level insights. But <clears throat> I think um, that, you know, what uh, the way I've been proceeding in my work is more solid. So. I briefly illustrate two types of universals that I've written about, co-expression universals and asymmetric coding universals. So co-expression universals are expressed by semantic maps. This idea actually goes back to the 1940s. The Danish linguist James Lev sort of first had something like a semantic map. So in order to express how the different words for tree, wood, and forest um, map uh, on the conceptual space in different languages, we need five different comparison meanings to express how they differ. So tree is a plant, wood is a material, wood for burning, small tree group, and a large tree group. Different languages co-express the comparison meanings in different ways, but there's a universal. In the implicational series, sequence from tree through wood to small woods and large forests, languages may only co-express adjacent meanings. So these semantic maps actually summarize uh, a range of lexical semantic <clears throat> universals. And it's the same for grammatical meanings. For example, re beneficiary, recipient, goal, and patient. In English, recipient and goal is co-expressed. So she gave money to her brother, she went to town. In Russian, recipient and beneficiary is co-expressed. The dative case, bratu, literally to the brother, 
can be used for she gave money to the brother, but also she caked, she baked a cake to the brother, for the brother. In Quechua, it's a beneficiary and the abnormal possess possessor that is co-expressed. In Hindi Urdu, it's the recipient and the patient. So the co suffix um, <clears throat> can be both dative and accusative. So we have a semantic map for the recipient function and for related function functions. And uh, uh, this again expresses uh, a range of universals because if a language has the same marker, for example, for locative and recipient, then it must also have this marker for goal and so on. So I call these co-expression universals, one could say polysemy universals, but I prefer the term co-expression. So on such a map, we can um, show the distribution of markers in different languages using uh, lines. So we don't need to claim here that we have detected some deep reality. We don't have to claim that recipient, goal, locative, or patient are universal concepts. They're just comparative concepts, uh, and we use them to compare languages. Now contrast this with Bart's paper, who also notes the co-expression of obligation and possession. In several languages, the means that are used for marking possession can be also used for marking obligation. John has a book, John has to read a book. And in Hindi Urdu, we have the dative uh, subject. So John ko sirdar hai, John has a headache, John ko seb kana hai, John has to eat the apple. Bengali is similarly the genitive subject in infinitive. So he claims that obligational constructions and possessive constructions are really existential constructions at some level of deep reality. So this is a brief uh, <clears throat> quotation. The analysis proposed here derives the answer by treating obligational constructions as existential constructions. But this is very difficult to demonstrate. So much of the work in this tradition remains at the speculative level. It's unclear how it can be extended to other languages but himself admits it works for English, German, and Spanish, but not for Catalan, because Catalan has two, di two different half verbs, and the uh, obligational construction uses a different one. Now, in the semantic map approach, there's no need to determine some underlying deep reality. You can simply measure the differences between languages by mapping the forms onto comparison meanings. So we can add another semantic role, let's call it obligate T here, the semantic map and then see how languages behave. So the obligate I put it here between the recipient and the possessor. <clears throat> okay, the next type of universals that I want to um, talk about briefly is the asymmetric coding universals. I've written many papers about asymmetric coding over the last few years, so it's just a short overview here. Many phenomena in grammars exhibit asymmetric coding, so zero versus short, or long versus, or short versus long, in a cross-linguistic systematically way. So we have singular versus plural, or nominative versus accusative, or additive, ablative, or positive, comparative, present, future, and so on. These phenomena have typically been treated under the heading of markedness, or differential marking. I have argued that they can all be treated together that they follow a single generalization. Frequently expressed grammatical distinctions get short coding, what I also call form frequency correspondences. Again, as in the case of semantic maps, there's no need to establish any kind of deep reality in order to, to test these universals. So I described this in quite some detail in the paper published earlier this year. So how do we explain universals? I've proposed in another methodological paper that there are really three main types of explanatory factors. The biocognitive constraints, these are constraints and possible representations, so what we can represent mentally, the functional adaptive constraints, and the mutational constraints, constraints on possible changes. I've claimed that the asymmetric coding universals are due to functional adaptive constraints, and I think the co-expression universals are mainly due to mutational constraints. I have not written about this yet. Biocognitive constraints also exist, of course, but they seem to be far less important 
and is often thought. So I think in generative linguistics, their role is greatly overestimated. So this paper is from a, another language science press book, which came out in uh, 2019. Okay, so um, this brings me to my conclusion. Um, in order to understand human language, we need to adopt a comparative approach. In order to describe languages, we have to use language particular categories, we, because we have not found an innate set of universal building blocks. <coughs> in order to compare languages, we need comparative concepts as uniform yardsticks of measurement. Language universals are of two main types. Co-expression universals that are expressed via semantic maps and asymmetric code universals expressed as implication and generalization. Now there's also word order universals which I didn't talk about here, but that would be a third main type. The description comparison approach is more promising than an approach that posits some deep reality and tries to go directly from particular languages to human cognition without worldwide comparison. So, I mean, I used to think of myself as a cognitive linguist. I used to go to cognitive linguistics conferences, but I, I think there's a danger of, of the shortcut directly from a language to cognition. I think we first have to go through worldwide comparison uh, in the manner uh, of Max Miller. And here's the references, and uh, all the materials are available uh, <coughs> on the website uh, where you can uh, download uh, these materials. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, now I will uh, uh, stop sharing. And I hope you can still hear it, even though you cannot see the slides anymore. Okay, <laughs> hmm. thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Martin. It's a very insightful paper covering the two major sources of language description, comparative and the deep reality approaches. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. okay. so, can we have some discussion on this one or are we moving? Yes, sir. Shobha? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much for this very enlightening yes. talk and very close to my heart, some of the ideas that you've discussed. I just have, I just wonder, you did mention about the possible constraints on language change. But I still want the comparative framework. How do we or where do we factor in the possibility of change, contact and change? Shobha, Shobha why don't yeah. you switch on your visual? Maybe he would like okay. to see you and then, <laughs> yes. Right. Sorry, Sorry. You, we had some uh, electric oh, you are on mobile. this morning. Are you on I'm mobile? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm on mobile because we have electricity <coughs> failure. Keep it away, away from you. Can you get Slightly it? away. Yeah, I get it. But yes, OK. Yeah, so I, my, my, uh, I, I heard the question. Okay. I, I heard the question. It was about uh, language change and language contact and, and how the perspective that uh, uh, I have presented uh, might help us understand language change and language contact. And and the answer to this is that uh, it doesn't really. So language change is something that I worked on quite extensively in the 1990s. And uh, um, I have a number of papers on grammaticalization. And I think it's really, really fascinating sort of to study um, general patterns of language change, but I sort of came away from this period of 10 years of studying language change, uh, realizing that I cannot really move away from the speculative nature. So from my perspective, uh, much of the kind of explanatory uh, attempts in language change and diachronic studies are, are so, so too speculative. So they, they kind of try to say, oh, this language had to develop case marking, for example, you know, like, like, for example, uh, Sanskrit, uh, you know, had all these cases and then they were lost. And so new case markers had to develop in, in the Indic languages, right? One could say this, but well, m maybe they didn't, right? Because there are other languages that don't have any case markers. So, so I, I don't quite know. So I, I think 
in order to <clears throat> understand the constraints, the, you know, what kind of really is the nature of human languages, it's kind of better to do worldwide comparison. But, but I continue to be interested in, in change, it still fascinates me, I just don't see so much explanatory angle. And language contact is a different matter there. There, I also have made some attempts with my work on no words, but it's also very difficult. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much. And if I may just add one more thing. Um, I, I think it seems that there is a, a tension between language specifics and um, language universals. So if I, if I draw your attention away from morphosyntax to, let's say, phonology, and if you compare any of the phenomena which have been widely studied, you put it, for example, palatalization, right? The, the, the most favorable constraints that people have postulated and attributed it to articulatory or whatever um, nations. But then if you look at the large number of languages from Tibetan Burman, for example, which haven't been studied, um, who did study, like Matisov, etc., they, they actually ended up saying that they are actually puzzled because they can't account for uh, some of the realities. So we find situations where uh, you find not just uh, contrastive or complementary distributions, but you also find uh, uh, probabilistic distributions happening in the same context where you have to move beyond lexic beyond phonological conditioning to include let's say lexical conditioning or maybe some other conditioning right Social conditioning i think this is where it sort of complicates these comparisons right and hence i think there'll always be a tension uh, between the specifics which we do find evidence for i'm talking about the quantitative testing we find a um, great deal of evidence for the language specifics the locals at the same time we also find to an extent the ones which is more larger which is more widely attested also serves a share two forces are constantly working hand in hand and that's what is adding to the puzzle of uh, understanding of human language <laughs> yes, um, um, absolutely. There's this constant tension, and uh, um, <clears throat> in the past, perhaps, you know, before the middle of the 20th century, um, th there was too little concern for universals. You know, some people say it was really only with the Chomsky movement that people started to really think about what unites all human languages, because before 1950, People were just studying particular languages and their particular histories. Uh, so, so there is a tension. And then it's sort of interesting that in the 1950s and 60s, both uh, Chomsky and Greenberg proposed sort of new ways of looking at languages in general. And, you know, the point of my talk was basically to say that the Greenbergian approach is more promising for understanding the nature of human languages uh, right now. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Anybody else? Hello? I think the next question is from Sonali Swain. Right. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sonali, you may please ask a question. Yeah, Dr. Sonali. Hello? Is she around? I request the compare to please ask the chairperson to present his remarks. Yeah, of course. Is there. Thank you, Professor Martin, for your inspirational and deep knowledge. We are really charmed by your enthusiasm. The next renowned to honor us with his presence is Professor Sailendra Mohan, the director of CIIN. Professor Sailendra Mohan is a linguist and an academician with more than 19 years of teaching experience at Deccan College Postgraduate and Research Institute, Pune. He has done extensive field work working on scores of major and minor languages of India. His wide study includes extensive research on an endangered language and a language isolate called Nihali, spoken in central India. He also specializes in language studies 
like Munda, a language family spread across India that includes languages like Santali, Kuruk, Kharia, Khasi, and so on. Professor Sailendra Mohan has also contributed a lot to language studies in India through his teaching and scores of research papers and book prior to joining CIM. Over to you, sir. Sir, please unmute yourself. Namaskar. Yalla Raghu, Namaskar. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the President of Linguistic Society of India, uh, Professor G. Uma Maheshwar Rao Garu, internationally renowned linguist, Professor Martin Hasperman from Max Planck Institute for Science of Humanities, Human History, Germany. Distinguished scholars, academicians, my esteemed colleagues from CIL, friends from media, dear students, Professor Martin Hasfelner for delivering a, such a thoughtful and insightful lecture on language description and language universal, especially delivering on comparative categories and language description. Thank you very much, sir, for your insightful lecture. I extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this inaugural session of 43rd International Conference of Linguistic Society of India, Equal SI abbreviated 43. I am indeed very happy today that in collaboration with Central Institute of Indian Languages, Mysore, we are here on this virtual platform to organize this conference. I would, however, I would have been much happier to host you in person. Uh, because of time constraint, I'll try to highlight only those points uh, which we are uh, initiating in near future instead of giving, uh, because we want to listen to our uh, uh, paper presenters. As we know uh, that uh, Central Institute of Indian Languages uh, is working on language archive repository of languages which are underrepresented in academia and other platform. We have so far curated linguistics and cultural data of 122 languages on it. Majority of these languages are from Northeastern region and other tribal communities. We soon expect to release it for the use of linguists, researchers, academics, and community members. Also, it has been designed in such a way that due stakeholders will be able to contribute in it against their own credit, even from remote places. So language archive and the children literature data bank uh, that we are also going to release, uh, data bank of children literature will help researchers and scholars, not only in their academic research, but also to create and develop language teaching materials, grammar, text, and digital dictionaries glossaries, tools and technology, etc., for the use of community members. Friends, as we already know that India has also a very diverse set of cultures and traditions, which greatly vary not only from one state to another, but even within the one state, and languages are the best devices to understand, explore, and nurture them. Therefore, linguists also additionally res uh, responsibility of promoting the interaction and mutual understanding between people of different cultures and traditions through their academic work and similar efforts. Only then our vision of Ek Bharat Shrestha Bhashan, Bharat mission can be realized. I much believe that Equal SI 43 will also become an active platform for the discussion of all issues and efforts in addition to pure academic discussions and research studies pertaining to discipline of linguistic literature, language, and other related areas. Once again, I extend my warm wishes to all the delegates, president, and other respected members of Linguistic Society of India, coordinators of the event, academicians and scholars, my colleague from CIL, session chairs, presenters, volunteers, and one and all for their kind patronage and contribution for the successful organization of this conference. And I especially thank Professor Martin Haskell-Meth Norskar for delivering such an insightful and thoughtful lecture. Thank you. Norskar, Jai Hind, Jai Bhat.
Thank you, Professor Haspel Math, and thank you, Sherland. Okay. <clears throat> Is the session ended now? This particular thing? Right. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah. Yes. Thank yes. you so much, sir, for sharing your great knowledge with us. Well, I'm extremely sorry to announce that due to time shortage, we are shifting editor's remark by Professor Umarani P to the valedictory session. So, almost heading towards the end of the inaugural session, I would like to request Dr. L. R. Prem Kumar for the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you. Dr. Kumar is a lecturer come junior researcher at CIIL. He is an officer in charge of Bharatwani project, also serving as a coordinator of Regional Language Center of CIIL. Uh, thank you, Ms. Misha. Uh, respected Professor Mamagisar Rao, President of the Linguistic Society of India, and Professor Sailendra Mungan, Director, CAL, and Professor Martin Haspel Math, and senior, senior Professor of CAL and institution and other institutions, uh, my dear colleagues and participants who have joined the inaugural session through virtual mode. A very good uh, good morning to all of you on this occasion, uh, on this wonderful uh, day and memorable occasion of the 43rd International Conference of Linguistic Society of India. I am very happy to be part of the program and propose the vote of thanks on behalf of CAL and my personal behalf. At the outset, I would like to express my deepest Gratitude to Professor Uma Maisarra, President of uh, LSA, who has kindly accepted to grace this function and has delivered the inaugural, ses inaugural address. It, uh, it would be definitely a good thing to this program and inspire the young participant. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, inspiring uh, speech. Uh, I express my sincere thanks to Professor Martin Aspel Math from Max Planck uh, Institute of Science and Humanity History, Germany, who has delivered keynote address in the in this conference. It was really interesting and that thought provoking like talk, sir. I hope heartily thanks our beloved director, Professor Sailendra Bhuvan, uh, Central Institute of Indian Languages, who has delivered the presidential address, gave us useful information. He has provided such a wonderful support that uh, we could organize this uh, conference successfully. Sir, thank you for your tasteless and un unconditional support. Uh, and also, I would like to uh, express my thanks to Dr. Tari Khan, coordinator, ECO LSI 43, who has welcomed the gathering. Uh, and also, thank uh, our due to Sri uh, Anus. Anu Anutuk Patacharya for the wonderful invocation and Mrs. Nisa Ubiyati for moderating the inaugural session. I thank the entire, fac entire faculty member of CL who have extended their support in many, way, many ways in carrying out this event successfully. Uh, in particular, I thank uh, my thanks are due to Professor Uma Papuswami, Marani Papuswami, Professor uh, B. R. Darvis Fernandez, uh, Professor C. V. Uh, Sivraman Krishnan, Dr. Narayan Choudhury, Dr. Pangaj, and uh, several others. Um, I also uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sri Sujay Sarkar and Alindra Brahma. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the academy and non academic staff. Uh, member of CAL who extended their support to organize this section successfully. My special thanks to all the technical staffs, uh, especially to Pavan Tejas, Mr. Tolkapim and team members um, who are working for organizing this uh, conference virtually. Uh, finally, I thank the media and uh, uh, Dr. Morelli Morgan for covering news about the program. Once, once again, I will thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Prem Kumar, for the acknowledgement. So with this, we come to the end of the memorable inaugural session of ICOLC 43. And the inaugural session is followed by the first technical session, which is again divided into four parallel sessions. 
So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Martin, for delivering lecture in such an early morning from Germany. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Uh, we would like to request all the uh, attendees, all the presenters and chairpersons to use the links we have shared just now for their respective sessions. We have four parallel sessions named as session 1A, 1B, 1C and 1D. Please see the program schedule, look at the topics and then accordingly join the different sessions. I hope we'll be able to start on time at 11.40. Your cooperation is highly desired there. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar. 1A, 1B, 1C and 1D. Please see the program schedule, Namaskar, look Adi. at the topics and then accordingly join the different sessions. I hope we'll be able to start on time at 11.40. Your cooperation is highly desired there. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar. Namaskar.